so your seminar on low carb Denver was amazing and it kind of answered all of my questions. Okay. <laughs> so how are you doing? <laughs> how was your weekend? <laughs> the link to the low carb Denver seminar right here. And then we could just chat. People need yeah, to yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Thing. I am known as Don Pedro, the sod father of the Ruminati. The Ruminati are those enlightened individuals that understand the essential role that ruminant animals play in humanity's past, present, and future. And I've been blessed to know people across the soil, plant, animal, and human cycle. And my role now is to introduce them to each other. Nice. I like that. So my viewers mostly know me. So um, I've been in holistic healthcare, studying nutrition since 1993. I take no insurance. So therefore, people have to get better in order for me to have a business. I have the largest non-insurance nutrition practice in the country. Um, I have five. There's five nutritionists total here. Um, it's not just diet consultations. We're actually repairing tissue to reverse chronic illness. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you is get your knowledge in agronomy and proteins, amino acids, because I've heard you speak in other venues on, on YouTube. And in a few months, I have a lecture in front of 150 medical doctors. I speak for 45 minutes regarding meat, keto carnivore, and how it's good. And then after I'm done, then the vegan speaks for 45 minutes about how plants are good and meat is bad. And then we sit for an hour, we debate each other and we take questions from the audience. So I got to know my stuff. And uh, I've been, you know, studying why vegans say the things they say since 2017, because that's when they found me on YouTube and started to attack me. So I'm pretty well versed on everything that they have to say. I can debunk anything that they say. And then, but I've learned recently though, like I was mentioning before about LDL and the cardiologists and why the cardiologists say the, same, the things they say, why PubMed is wrong, the preponderance of science in PubMed regarding LDL, why that's wrong. So anyways, there's my intro. So my goal was to um, <clears throat> learn as much as I can from you about amino acid deficiencies, because people talk about protein deficiency, but you talk about when you look at a label, it says three grams of protein, that's crude protein. And so whether it's digestible or not, that's an issue. You know, whether it has all the amino acids, that's an issue. You know, all, there's a lot of factors regarding quality and quantity of amino acids. So I don't know, you, you probably have more to share about that beyond what you said in Australia. Hmm. And then the, the other thing was the um, ruminant animals and uh, sequestering carbon in the process to regenerate regenerative farming to you know if, if if people believe that carbon is a problem you know then what what does the role of regenerative farming have of to solve that problem and can it be done globally or at least you know like maybe pick a couple of big states and if they had all regenerative farming you can make a, a big positive impact with that well sure so i uh... There's a lot of ways for us to go forward on this, and I'm happy to provide sources and information for you to review, um, as I understand your desire to prepare for this event, right? Um, and good luck to you. Um, you know, unfortunately, this isn't a scientific issue that, you know, you're preparing for, right? This. This is worldview, belief system, a lot of, you know, so, okay, all of that said. That's a good um, point, philosophy. Here's where we can start the conversation. The U.S. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, um, publishes every year a budget sources and sinks for anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions 
and they bucket things into the way that they bucket them. So there's an industry, there's a power or energy, there's transportation, there's land use change, which is where agriculture and forestry get represented. All of that land use change bucket is somewhere in the 10% range of total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions for the United States. So energy transport, these are in the 25 sort of percent range. At the same time, they account, they estimate sinks, right? So that amount for land use is equivalent to 12% of the total emissions. So wait, so define. So, okay, go ahead. Define sinks. Oh, it, that would be sequestration. That would be removal of CO2 and equivalents from the atmosphere. So already in the US today, current practices, land use change is the only bucket which is carbon negative. Okay. And under current technology and reality, it's the only one that can do this at scale, right? Okay. I mean, 12%. Now, we have various conversations that are probably worth pursuing, but it's important for us to recognize where we actually are, as so, opposed to the conversation, right? And when somebody says cows are bad because they fart methane and carbon comes out and it's bad, but what you're saying is like agriculture is labeled as a carbon sink. Agriculture, forestry as a bucket is actually carbon negative. In so the, the United argument, States today. Yeah, so the argument that cows are bad, agriculture is bad, it's not. The EPA says... Right, right. And, and, and that's EPA figures, so argue with the EPA. There was also a paper that came out, I think, April, May timeframe, um, which I should probably start making a list of things to send you. Um, Manzano and colleagues... And basically what they say is the emissions that come from wildlife dominated savannas versus livestock dominated savannas are equivalent. That's so that makes logical sense to me. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> you know, but we're in the conversation space where people imagine that there's a natural state with zero emissions, right? And so, so what they estimated from their work, and again, a savanna is a mixed grass tree environment, very open trees. I mean, it's not at all like a forest. So it would be sort of that space in between closed canopy forest and completely open grassland, right? That, there's that biome in between. Um, weather and, and so grassland and, and savanna would be included to remain healthy must either be grazed or burnt. Right? That's the nature of that environment. I'd rather graze it. And whether that grazing takes place by wild ruminants or um, domesticated ruminants, Doesn't methane matter. emissions are a function of that natural cycling of CO2 from the atmosphere via photosynthesis into biomass. That biomass being consumed by ruminants then cycles that carbon back to the atmosphere. So there, there's, there's far more nuance at play in this conversation space 
than our public conversation, the advocacy work, the various interest groups frequently allow for. Um, so <clears throat> if I, and, and I, I will point out it's belches, not bur uh, farts. So it's, you know, <laughs> um, that there are, there's a process by which methane gets oxidized to CO2 in the atmosphere. And, and this process takes about 10 years. So if we're talking about a cycling of carbon where CO2 via photosynthesis, via photosynthesis gets reduced into carbohydrate, plant fiber, sugars, other carbohydrates in the cell contents, and then that's ingested by herbivores, primarily ruminants, but not exclusively. That fiber is only utilizable by microorganisms because they're the only organisms that produce cellulase that's going to break the bonds between the glucose units that make fiber. But we can't do that. Okay, so that process then also produces methane in the rumen environment, which is belched out. There's a lot of things we can do to address that. But overall, we're talking about this cycling and then that methane becomes oxidized to CO2 within this 10 year frame. Compare that to methane that comes from, we'll say fossil sources for lack of a better word. Well, the same process of oxidation is gonna take place with them, but the CO2 that results then represents an increase in CO2 as opposed to a cycling of CO2 or carbon. Okay, so there's differences and, and the IPCC itself in its last assessment said that by using the metric they had been using to estimate global warming potential, they were overestimating the impact of enteric methane by a factor of three to four times and underestimating the global warming potential impact of this fossil methane by about three to four times. Okay, so if we're gonna grow cereals and legumes and nuts, we're going to be using more fossil energy to do that than we will by producing meat and milk from grazing animals. And so now we need to account for that in our impacts, which we haven't done well. Um, there was also a paper, I think this summer, that said if we were to shift, and it wasn't much, I'm going to say 15% as the number, but I may be wrong on that, but it was something on that order. 15% of animal sourced food from monogastrics to ruminants, we would make a significant impact on emissions and we would reduce and we would then have more food for like half a million people because we have this competition, feed food competition going on. Monogastrics, that competition is far greater than it is between us and ruminants. The monogastric meaning like a horse. Uh, or a, a pig or poultry or fish or us. Um, so these sorts of nuances in all of these debates you know we need to be aware of them and then find the right way to communicate them into a space where nuance isn't always valued right and mm -hmm. so they're going to say you know think of all that you know all that food food for humans feed for animals think of all that food 
that could be available if we stopped using that land to graze livestock, right? The problem there is people confuse agricultural land with arable land. So arable land is the land that's suitable for cultivation, primarily to produce annual crops like cereals, legumes, vegetables. Um, that represents a very small portion of the Earth's surface and a small portion of the agricultural land. <clears throat> the vast majority of agricultural land is really only best suited or maybe only suited for grassland grazing systems. Mm -hmm. So one of my definitions, which hasn't received a whole lot of pushback, is that basically agriculture and and is 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 humanity's manipulation of its environments to increase the production of biomass mm -hmm. and the vast majority of the biomass that's produced in agriculture is not human edible and so even there was one estimate that was done in Europe and they said for every kilo of vegan food, four to five kilos of inedible biomass are produced. Hmm. Yeah. And so even like a wheat crop or a corn crop for grain, right. more than half of that biomass of that crop is not human edible. Right. So I was raised on a commercial farm started by my great grandfather in 1937. So um, I spent 17 summers working there starting as I was, since I was a kid. Mm. And my dad taught me like you have one stalk of corn, how many ears and it was sweet corn, right? So how many ears mm -hmm. of sweet corn do you get from one stalk of corn? And I would ask this to my friends in grade school and high school and college and people said five, six. No, the answer is one. You get one, one ear of corn per stock. So there's a lot of biomass there in order to have this thing to, that you're eating. And and how much of that thing that you're eating isn't edible? That's the cob, right? Right. So yeah. so even that, right? Even even the bit that we harvest and we ship to market, how much I mean, unless we're, you know, cutting it off and freezing it or canning it or whatever, but I mean what people see in the market and so yeah uh, where where was this farm by the way northwest ohio swanton ohio yeah okay so when northwest. we processed the corn we packed it into crates and whatever you know the ears are too small you had to throw it out and it just right. it got dumped into a spreader to go back into the field or there was a local farm pig farmer mm -hmm. and he'd drive his truck and we would fill his truck up for free you know, he'd drive away mm -hmm. eggs. Yeah. Well, here, here in Oregon, um, there's cannery corn. That's you know for and and that produces a lot of just what you're saying. You know, the husks and the cobs and whatever, and that material gets hauled to the dairies, and and fed as a as a feed for dairy cows. Yeah. And one of my lines is you, you can't get milk from almonds, but you can get it from almond hulls because right. the hulls in California are a big feed resource for the California dairies. So one of the things that I've gotten really interested in is this integrated cropping livestock systems work that's taking place in various parts around the world. And <clears throat> here in the US, right, we went from having diversified farms to very specialized farms over the last half century. And there's a lot of reasons that that happened. Um, but even so, there's no, you know, plant agriculture without animal agriculture, and there's no animal agriculture without plant agriculture. They're integrated, but it looks different. Um, 
<clears throat> in the southern plains like Oklahoma and Kansas, there's a lot of wheat fields that get grazed in the wintertime and early spring. So they, they put these, you know, weaned cattle on them to put some more pounds on them and feed them during the winter. And then people make a decision, do I want to keep grazing that wheat or do I want to try to harvest a wheat crop, in which case then they have to pull the animals off before, you know, the, the head of the, the plants go reproductive and that growing point elevates to where the animals would damage it. So there's that. Uh, here in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, we have a lot of seed grass seed production. And in the wintertime, you'll find a lot of sheep grazing on those grass seed fields to manage the biomass to favor uh, seed production. So you have that in Nebraska, you have a lot of cattle grazing on aftermath corn stover following a corn yield. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, with all the growing interest in growing cover crops where you have um, so you, you have your annual crop that maybe in August you harvest, you still have a few weeks where maybe you could get a little growth and you don't want that soil uncovered. So you plant something else to grow until winter time and then the next summer you or spring, you then come back into the, 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 the main crop. Well, you can graze those cover crops and, and people are figuring out how to do that in North America. And, you know, North America is a very diverse region. You can find a lot of differences. So it's, it's getting harder and harder for us to say, well, this is land that only is in plant agriculture. And this is land that's only in animal agriculture. Um, but that doesn't stop people from confusing the two. So I have one example where if you imagine that the Earth's land surface is a soccer field, you know, within the boundaries, the agricultural land wouldn't even make it from the goal line to the near end of the center circle. Oh, okay. Right? So the vast majority of land area is not agricultural, mm. but that's agricultural total. Um, the arable land would only make would only be within that penalty eighteen you know meter box or whatever only from the goal line to the penalty spot. In that first box, yeah. So that's the difference between the arable land and the agricultural land. And then we have to acknowledge that we're losing that arable land uh, for a number of reasons, but it's an endangered resource. And that's part of the interest in all these, all this effort of soil conservation and um, <clears throat> in various forms of cropping systems. Yeah, the re the reality still is that when we till the soil, we damage it <laughs> and tillage is still a practice on the majority of the Earth's arable land and it's people don't frequently think of that when they think of different forms of food production. Yeah. So I, one of my favorite supplement companies is called Standard Process, and they're in Palmyra, Wisconsin, which is kind of like a big valley. I mean, it's pretty flat there, but hmm. called the Kettle Moraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So they, you know, they have these implements that they purchased from um, Eastern Europe, and it's far advanced regarding, you know, American farmers, they just spray. But in other areas, like in Eastern Europe, they're using implements that can dig up um, uh, weeds really well. Or if they, let's say they're harvesting potatoes, they can cut the top of the plants off before they harvest the, 
the root vegetable and it's and they're not spraying anything and of course and they have this other implement that has lasers that's got eyes camera eyes and it looks for weeds and it'll shoot a laser at that so i'm just like sharing this because you know the, the intelligent use of um of land you know adva advancements are are happening in in european countries and it's being brought over here hopefully in large masses, so we're not using so much uh, so much spray. So I well, wonder, the, and, you, know, you know, we we have to also think that the vast majority of the, well, the majority of the world's farmers are still using draft animals. Right. Okay. So whatever we do in the high income countries, Europe, North America, we also have to think about the world's farmers and the world's population and you know we we're, there's 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 lots of work that needs to get done um and, and and unfortunately too few people are aware of the work that is being done um let alone you know we as i said in the talk that i gave in sydney you know we had people saying that you know we you know, we we need a plant based diet, and my response is humanity's diet is already plant based, and maybe that's the problem. You know, when you're getting your calories, especially from highly processed foods, which are now the majority of our calories in the U.S. and probably in Europe as well, certainly in Australia, certainly in other countries, um, when you're getting the majority of your protein from these processed foods or even just from plant foods in general. I mean, wheat is the single largest source of protein in humanity's diet. And wheat is a really poor quality protein source. Now we can combine it with animal source foods and, you know, we can ob obtain the nutrition that we need but that's not the reality for a great bulk of humanity. And yet we have people saying, oh, we need to be more like that. <laughs> and, and others of us are saying, just a moment, do we have some evidence that maybe in fact that's harmful? And, and so this is part of the conversation space that I certainly have been trying to speak into. And it, I, I wish you luck in your <laughs> efforts to do the same. Yeah, thanks. So I want to bring up um, one, two more things, really. One is the um, ratings of the protein. So DIAS is one rating system. And then the other, there's that one subject. The other subject is, um, I don't know if there's too much to comment on it, but you know, Alan Savory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he said that if you have tall grasses and they're not burnt or they're not grazed, the grasses fall over and it, he said the soil turns acidic and it's harder to grow the next season a grass or you know it's harder to grow vegetation on dead grasses have you heard of that yeah i've, I've heard that yeah. um there's there's a number of things to say about it number one is um the tillering of plants is influenced by having light hit the base of the plants. There's a school of thought that says, you know, we're supposed to eat all this grass and then move on. But there's other people who are doing work that are showing that if you move your animals after maybe only 40% is removed, you end up with more production from the grass and better animal performance. So there's a number of ways to look at this. Um, but in general, if we, we we've had these unfortunate examples where well meaning people came in and they said livestock grazing is the problem. We're going to exclude grazing from these natural grassland areas. And then so many years later, they look and they say, huh, we've got brush encroachment, we've got less wildlife diversity, we have less diversity in plants species, 
And so maybe we weren't right about excluding livestock grazing. And there's been a number of these examples. So uh, absolutely um, comfortable with the idea that grasslands evolved under grazing. Isn't that remarkable? Um, and, and, and also periodic fire, um, whether that was natural or it was anthropogenic. And there's a long history of anthropogenic fire in the United States, um, well, in North America, well preceding um, US. So, um, and now that in some areas where for a number of reasons fire has been excluded, we see this brush encroachment which then changes lots of aspects, including even the hydrology within the soil. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, we're, we're finding species becoming, for lack of a better word, weeds, because they're allowed to survive what periodically would have held them in check in the grasslands. Yeah. And so I think it was, there's a species of cedar and when the Society for Range Management was in Albuquerque, we did a field trip and they were actually you know, like pulling these plants out by the roots, which you can imagine that that's quite the undertaking. <clears throat> but they were saying, you know, if it's under six inches, maybe, and, and you do sort of the grassland fire, you can see those plants being killed, the seedlings, the yeah. grasses come back. But where they persisted <clears throat> was on the rock piles, you know, the outcroppings where there wasn't enough grass. Yeah. And so you'd still have them there, even if it was a sort of wildland fire that came through, you'd still have these but they'd be in little areas as opposed to becoming these almost complete stands of, of this plant. Yeah. So, so in, in Michigan and in my, so in my backyard, there's a lot of buckthorn. I got some woods behind me. Buckthorn is an invasive species. It's a nasty plant. It's ugly. It's sharp and it mm -hmm. grows. It's it. We have snow right now on the ground. It's still green. Right. There's no native species that's green right now in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, about more than 10 years ago, I was part of a tour, a tour and uh, the announcer said that the largest tree in the state of Michigan is buckthorn. They have a big, huge, but it's like, wait a minute, that's a non-native invasive species. And we're claiming, oh, look at our biggest tree. It's a buckthorn. Why don't somebody needs to go chop that tree down, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and once upon a time, I mean, you know, Michigan was the, you know, Pacific North, it was the Northwest, right? Michigan and Minnesota and the, the you know, the woods and all of that. So, yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so then you asked about the, the dias versus PD cas. Yeah. So and, give us a crash course on what that what that is. Well, DIAS is an acronym that stands for Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. And PDCAS is Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, I believe is what that stands for. It, the PDCAS is what had been in place from the beginning of the 90s, I believe. And so part of our challenge is, again, the difference between ruminants and monogastrics like us. There's no such thing as an essential amino acid in a ruminant's diet. They have the microorganisms in their rumen, the, the, the first you know, part of their stomachs, multi-compartment stomachs. Those microorganisms are capable of synthesizing all the amino acids so they can capture nitrogen from various sources and with the energy that's provided by the rest of the diet they form this microbial protein the ruminant then ends up digesting those microorganisms so it's a very specialized um, symbiotic relationship 
humans have essential amino acids. What I think there's 20 total and nine of them are essential or indispensable, depending on the, the language. And even that is under some, you know, examination. Now people are saying, well, okay, we've got some that are conditionally indispensable. And then we've got other people saying, yeah, but if you could devise a completely artificial diet, like nobody would do that. Right. Um, and you somehow eliminated all of these others. Yes, you could make some, but do we have evidence that you could make all that you needed? Right. So there's, there's a lot of that kind of conversation even around that well-established terminology. Going back into the 1880s, I believe, there was this work to look at feeds and food and say, how value, you know, how do we use this stuff? How do we quantify or qualify this? And, and one of the, so they developed this system. One of the techniques that was used in that system was to measure the total nitrogen in a sample. We can then express that as a percent nitrogen. And then we multiply that number by 6.25 and we convert it into something we call crude protein. We're doing that because we're assuming that all the nitrogen that was there was in protein and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Okay, that works okay in ruminants for the reason I just described. Not so good for us, like let's say we have a, a green leafy vegetable that has a significant amount of nitrate in it. Well, the nitrate nitrogen ends up being expressed as part of the crude protein nitrogen. <clears throat> so that's one of the key issues. Again, we as monogastrics, we need specific amino acids. Crude protein doesn't give us any way to know that. It's been certainly over four decades since swine nutritionists started balancing rations on an indispensable amino acid basis. Wow. Oh, about over 10 years ago, an expert consultation of the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, said that we ought to start looking at indispensable amino acids as individual nutrients. And, and so, okay, that's the conversation there. Um, so in the early 90s, there was this obvious need to get beyond crude protein or any of the other ways that we had of talking about digestibility. And so they came up with PD-CAS, but PD-CAS had a number of limitations, partly just because of the nature of the work. Um, but every people involved with it understood those limitations. And then, as I say, in, in the early, um, 2010s, 2011 was when they had the meeting. Um, they endorsed this other means, which dias. had some significant dias, exactly, which had these advantages. One, it looked at the digestive, how much of a specific amino acid disappeared between the mouth and the ileum. Mm. PDCAS looked at fecal digestibility and there's significant contamination that takes place or whatever the right word is within the large intestine and cecum. There's bacteria, uh, micro, um, microbial activity, which could skew the data a little bit. So this was better. Um, they used pigs primarily as the model. Um, they, again, looked at individual amino acids as opposed to total crude protein. 
Uh, PDCAS, for a number of reasons, ended up overestimating the digestibility of plant source proteins and underestimated the digestibility of animal source proteins. Um, and then because DIAS looks at individual amino acids, you now have tools that let you say, okay, we're going to have wheat or some wheat product that's deficient in lysine, but when we combine it with some meat, the meat's going to provide sufficient lysine to balance out the insufficiency from the wheat, so we have a, a, a better description of the quality of protein in, in that meal. Um, so this has been the recommendation. It's hard to get the data. People are working on it. And I think it's fair to say that there are a number of people that don't want this because it really interferes with some of the narratives um, going all the way back to people like Francis Moore LePay and Diet for a Small Planet. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it's again, not a scientific issue, right? We, but it's, it's another complication in this whole space is people think that the recommended daily allowance for protein at 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight is the target. Right. When in fact, that's a minimum, right. um, and and so then we have the evidence that says maybe 1.2 to 1.6 ought to be a better target and then there's the the nuance that says oh it needs to be high quality protein or reference protein which isn't always clearly stated as being meat eggs dairy seafood right so putting all that together we're already on a plant-based diet worldwide mm -hmm. dias shows uh, amino acid um, utilization better than PD, PDCAS that's only been around for 10 years or so. And we need specific amino acids. Putting all this together in your lecture mm -hmm. in Australia, you basically mm -hmm. said everybody's deficient in protein. And you had a graphic to show. And, and then the the one, you know, 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So all the, So that needs to come up. The quality of protein needs to come up. The source of protein needs to be more animal-based and not plant-based. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at protein crude versus amino acids total, we're deficient. Everybody's deficient in protein. Well, you know, everyone, yeah. If you, so I have it, learned, I have learned in relationships that <laughs> if you want to start an uh, argument, you use always or never, right? <laughs> and if I did it one time, everybody, I'll everybody. argue with you, <laughs> right? Everybody. everybody. So that that was the that was the trigger <laughs> word. Um, it's it's quite clear that the vast majority of humanity does not have sufficient. I'm going to use the word protein, but then I'm going to immediately say uh, um, that that the dietary quality of the food supply for the vast majority of humanity is insufficient. Okay, yeah. that, that that that's looking globally. We have some evidence from like NHANES data from the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, where they looked and they saw that 40% of Americans don't get enough protein, and most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough. <laughs> and that's considering all protein as if it's equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. they, they were just looking at total crude protein and also driving towards a 0.8 grams per kilogram as if that's the target. So even with those two really significant problems, they were at that. And, and yet they can, and you will find people that say, well, we're eating too much protein or protein's not a nutrient of concern. The data just flatly refutes that. Um, and then there's, of course, we have to remember, we don't only get essential amino acids from animal source foods. We get all the essential nutrients from animal source foods. And sometimes we only get them from animal source foods. And then there's the observations. I think uh, Cordain and colleagues looked at um, 
the hunter gatherer societies that they could find and look at the data that they could gather for what they were eating in their diet and the percent of calories from animal source foods ranged from like 30 percent of calories to a hundred percent right and and the mean seemed to be somewhere around 70 right yeah. and then um you you had uh nord hagen and colleagues looked at um if you get below 30 percent of calories in the diet from animal source foods you start see on a population basis you start seeing rapidly increasing deficiencies in multiple micronutrients right so there's that marker which is interesting that that kind of aligned with cordain's observation and then there was a, a paper by view uh, most recently that said if you're not getting 50 percent of your protein from animal source foods then you're likely to be seeing non-protein deficiencies non-protein that, say that again yeah. so if you're not getting so so of your protein from animal sources then you're getting non-protein deficiencies also exactly yeah 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 so so I mean, the, while the, we might the bottom line is you have cows eating grass the grass is pulling minerals up from the soil through the roots to the top and the cows eat the minerals and accumulate minerals into the muscle tissue and liver etc and then you're just eating this super mineral product you know people buy multi minerals and they take these pills when you can just be eating meat because that's you know and what i was in a um i did a a seminar once um in uh, oregon and it was on a farm and it, had, it was like a marketing seminar and next to the farm there was a a, a barn for cows so they had the hay loft at the top and the cows below it was empty. No, no hay, no cows. I walked in there. It smelled like sugar, right? Absolutely was sweet. You know, the lesson it here is like, hay is sugar. Cows eat the sugar. They turn into meat. Don't, you know, don't you be eating sugar. Just let the cows yeah. do that. That's their job. You know, plus. Oh, well, the- yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what's, you know, they spin fiber into gold right they they digest fiber so a cow eat you know a cow um eating its normal diet can't be more than six percent and probably closer to five percent of its total ration being crude fat ether extract right you put too much fat into a rumen and you start to depress fiber digestibility Mm -hmm. and that's a problem so okay five or six percent goes in but then by the time the microbes get done breaking down that fiber they're producing volatile fatty acids which the cow then absorbs so maybe 70 maybe more percent of her caloric intake comes from volatile fatty acids that are produced by the microbes. Okay. So again, we, you know, we're, we're turning fiber into gold in terms of, you know, animal fat, milk fat. Um, the microbes themselves form uh, my, um, um, micronutrients like vitamin B12. Right. Which yeah. are then absorbed. Yeah. So we have all of this, and then we could even look back far enough anthropological data, archaeological data. It's quite clear to me, at least, that human beings evolved from scavenging primates who were utilizing the remains of herbivores that had been killed by apex predators. And as a result of that, certain physiological and morphological changes could take place in the organism as that organism evolved into what became modern human beings. And there's a lot of very interesting sort of differences, but 
you know, we are a product of the grasslands. Right. And so, so, so when our ancestors came upon a carcass and most of the, a lot of the muscle meat was consumed already by the apex predators and the vultures and the hyenas, what's left? You got the brain, you got the spinal cord. So we had this thing, we got this thing called a thumb. So we'd pick up a rock and smash the brain and eat the fat, the brain, the nervous system. But I, I want to bring in, I'm sure you've heard about the protein leverage hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? So like we can have too many, too much energy, which is fat plus carbs and not enough protein. That's where we're at now. We have a plant-based diet, lots of carbs, low protein. And then 200 years ago or earlier, more protein, less energy. So people were trying to get the fat. They're trying to, you know, get the bone marrow. They're trying to get the brain. So we we cross that with the modern food supply being so high in energy, so low in, in uh, protein. I'm saying this because, you know, cows could be 40% 40, 40 fat. The steak can be 40% fat. I had Wagyu steak like a month ago from Japan, like the legitimate best bite of food i've ever had it's like i had three ounces it melted in my mouth like ice cream but it was steak it was amazing so much fat in there and the protein be being actually quite low <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so i'm just saying like there's people that should not have fatty steaks right because they're trying to lose weight right yeah, what they yeah, yeah. protein yeah and they want yeah. to decrease their energy intake so the low carb and low fat higher protein right so there's Medicinal ways to look at look at this, but if you have a twelve year old person that's like super depressed or whatever, they have you know neurological problems and they need ketosis. Maybe they have seizures. They should do super high high fat and and moderate protein. The key, the classical ketogenic diet. So there's ways to address these macronutrients for better health, depending on. Yeah, the I mean my my role at this point, I hope, is as a bridge builder between the various communities that I've been introduced to, yeah. you know, so I, I'm a forage agronomist. I'm a ruminant nutritionist. I'm trained in grassland sciences, all of that. And so I operate very comfortably in that space. As a result of personal experience, I've learned a great deal about human nutrition and human health. And I find myself in this really happy space of being all of those, you know, healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy people, or animals, healthy people, all of this wonderful circle. Now that circle has been distorted in a number of ways. And there's reasons for that, you know, sort of back to before you tear down a fence, learn why it was put there in the first place kind of thing. So it would be good for us to spend some time but the first thing people need to understand is that there's all this good work that's taking place that's showing these various things now i'm not a medical doctor nobody should treat what i say as medical advice right <clears throat> on the other hand i'm happy to introduce you to <laughs> physicians and clinicians and the literature because uh, as one, uh, the, the man that went right before me at, in Sydney, one of his last lines is don't outsource your health, right? And, and, and we have this weird relationship with the healthcare professions in the United States where, you know, we sort of, you know, like somehow they're the guide of our personal health. And I get it, there's lots of things in here, but, as I said, nobody's coming. <laughs> it's up to us individually right. to find out and make the changes and then learn how we can evaluate how those changes are working for us, yeah. right? It, it always has to come back to that sort of, how's that working for you kind of question. Yeah. And, and that's ultimately what I see with people who go on, an exclusively plant source food diet is it typically doesn't work well for them. And they typically have to come to some other, you know, sort of approach. And and the the danger one is when that's inflicted on children. Oh yeah. Who are typically going through critical 
growth and development stages, which if their nutritional needs are not met, then they will never make up for those deficits. Yeah. I and, think that, and, and, yeah. I, I think the greatest disservice that, okay, we have the sort of quote unquote natural world, like eating meat is good. You know, some plants are good, whatever. And then the other, I'm going to say not natural world says meat is bad. Mm. The greatest, the greatest riff between these two thoughts is L, all centered around LDL cholesterol. Because yeah. <laughs> when your LDL goes high, cardiovascular disease goes up. <gasps> but the, well, I've, I've been deep diving in this in the last two months. LDL is for the immune system. LDL is antiparasitic, antimicrobial, antibacterial. It, it captures endotoxins from bacteria. It, it kills off um, precancerous cells. Also, there's a new uh, generation of statin drugs, PSK9 or PSCK9 inhib inhibitors. Well, the PSCK9 thing, that's for the immune system. Mm -hmm. So when people have a chronic infection and they could have it for 20 years, LDL is high, the PSCK9, all that stuff is high. Lipoproteins are high. HDL goes down. You know, all the standard triglycerides go up. It's all infection. Now you can have a bad diet, creating an infection, creating these uh, lab markers. You can have a bad diet, creating visceral fat. Visceral fat acts like an infection, creating all the same lab markers. So like the, the, scary, the scary thing is, oh, LDL is, causes heart disease. No, it's not. It's a bystander. It's trying to help the infection that's causing the heart disease. So like I've been deep dive, it's been, you know, my, my whole career, but really in the last two, two, two months, what's really been helpful is that Google has incorporated AI. So you ask a question, it gives you the answer. And then you can click on that. It goes straight to the resource in PubMed, the sentence, it goes straight to the sentence hmm. for the answer. Whereas before that, you know, you, you get a, a bunch of like sponsored websites and then Healthline or Medline, which is garbage. So, so yeah, we need to, we need to understand the LDL and, and all those changes in the lipids and the glucose and the insulin, those are all side effects or effects of an infection. So like I've had yeah. people with, you know, infected root canals, chronic candida, chronic mold. Like when I had mold, my lipoprotein A was more than double what it should have been. So so there's these infections, but if you choose to eat junk food, you're eating seed oils, you're eating, you know, processed food, 57% of Americans calories is junk food. Mm -hmm. If you're going to continue to do that, you need to take the drugs that the medical doctors give you. That's your punishment, really. Well, yeah. So, so one of the thoughts from animal husbandry is it's fairly well accepted that your herd health program begins with proper nutrition, right? That, that, yeah. that you don't treat yourself out of malnutrition. Now, that's going to open up the conversation of what is proper nutrition, right? Just right. what you were saying, right? So I have my three keys. One is, one of my essential messages is that public health will be harmed and is being harmed, frankly, by too little animal source food in the diet. Right. Now we can discuss what the proper level is, but let's at least get that acknowledged. Number two is that a livestock agriculture is essential for sustainable food systems and ruminant animals, particularly so, right? We can't have sustainable food systems without animal agriculture. And, and number three is these foods are our ancestral foods, right? And, and our cultural heritage, regardless of where that emanates from, right? This is how we pass on family traditions. This is how we bond. This is so, so this, this myth of a plant only diet is an invention of the high income Western world. It does not exist in nature, as you were saying, it doesn't exist outside of that space. Um, and, and Adele Haidt is someone who had and still does a tremendous influence on me. And that mm -hmm. goes back now uh, many years. Right. Um, and 
she gave me the idea of, you know, people of, and this might be something to think about as you prepare. So the, we, people of goodwill ought to be able to agree that we should focus on providing adequate essential nutrition and maintaining metabolic health, those two things. Now you could quibble because I would say, well, I'd rather shoot for optimal than adequate, right? But okay, that's a place to start. And then how about, you know, I think she used the word restore metabolic health um, because of, again, the, too many people don't understand that the pandemic of metabolic illness we're facing is in fact malnutrition. Right, for sure. And, and yet even in the scientific literature, you will find um, how do they, 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 in some places they talk about the double burden of malnutrition. So that's where you have, say, emaciated children and obese mothers in the same population, right? And, and Gary Taubes talks about this, like, how are you going to explain that? Like, she's sneaking a Snickers bar where her child is, you know, no, I'm sorry, maternal instinct being what it is you're going to have to find a different explanation than that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then you can also find people talking about the triple burden of malnutrition. And when they talk about the third piece, they're talking about overnutrition. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about obesity as overnutrition, mm -hmm. when in fact it's malnutrition. Of proteins. Of, well, of, you know, we, we can then get into that bit, right? So is it, it, does what we eat influence what we eat? I think, you know, the protein leveraging hypothesis is one explanation for that, right? We're eating a poor protein quality diet. It's deficient in lysine. What happens? Well, swine studies would suggest <laughs> that, you know, we get, greater subcutaneous fat deposition, we get smaller muscle size, and we get greater intramuscular fat deposition in lysine deficient growing pigs than we do in sufficient growing right. pigs. I need to repeat what you just said. Does, does what we eat affect what we eat? Okay, yeah. like there's a high satiety diet. Like I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, Ted Naiman, you know, been a fan mm -hmm. for three, mm -hmm. four years. And one of the bigger biggest arguments on Twitter is low, you know, low calorie diet. Like that's all you need. You can eat sugar. I just some cardiologist just today was like, sugar doesn't cause disease. Sugar doesn't cause overweight or obesity. Sugar. It's like, and this guy lost a bunch of weight. Did he eat more sugar to lose weight? Like, come on, give me a break. So yeah, what you eat does affect what you eat. So the high satiety diet is the answer to that. So it, 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 and yet too many people still think obesity is a risk factor for chronic disease rather than a manifestation of metabolic derangement, which also manifests. Okay. Again, I'm not that kind of doctor. I'm just saying there's a lot of information out here. The one thing that has been impactful <coughs> to my tribe is <clears throat> this we have this analogy that we use in in soil fertility of Liebig's barrel this this analogy of saying okay we have this wooden this this wooden barrel that has these different length staves in it right and so the shortest stave is the one that sets the volume for the barrel right you can't they hold any more water wood that comes up so exactly the the top. slats that make up yeah. the side of the barrel nice. okay so um in until you lengthen that shortest stave you're not going to increase the volume of the barrel so you yeah. can put all kinds of money and effort into these other things and you're not going to increase the yield the volume you're not going to get an economic return. You may create toxic conditions because you're now so far out of balance. Lots of things. 
Um, and so I've applied that to the whole question of hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, right? And if that is 80% of the problem that we're facing in chronic disease, which I'm persuaded, then that needs to be addressed. And then these other things can undoubtedly show up. But until we get there, then it's a lot of sort of conjecture and reaching beyond the data. And I'm going to suggest that's how we got it where we are to begin with. People had some little piece of data of varying quality, and then they extrapolated way too far. And, you know, human nature being what it is, I see exactly how it happens. And I watch it happening in some of my colleagues and I'm going, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Are you even aware of this information? And often they aren't. And so, you know, it, it, it becomes an interesting journey. Um, so back to we, you know, there would not be modern human beings if it weren't for ruminant animals, right? Modern society wouldn't exist without ruminant animal agriculture. And we're not going to meet the needs of 2050 without improving the productivity and efficiency of ruminant animal systems globally in ways appropriate to those locations, environments, um, societies. But those are just givens for me at this point. Then the question is, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Videos like this, I guess, start somewhere. Education. Well, and, and you know, I'm doing what I can to interact with researchers. Um, hopefully some material will get into the literature. Um, hopefully indeed videos just like this um and in addition um i think that there's power in individuals you know so um when you improve your health you are improving the world and maybe for most people maybe that is the thing that we can do right you know yeah. it, it it's all it's all easy to say you need to be doing whatever right those people right well how about us but I, what 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 can we do but i think that i'm i'm a fan of nina teichel's and when she says you know there's always this grassroots um movement to eat better and be healthy but it really does in in the world of food and diet it does start at the top it's the usda dietary guidelines you know committee and their recommendations because they control universities and the military and the you know school lunch programs and every they control everything and so currently well, I'm, I'm not good yeah i'm not going to argue with that and there are people doing that at the same time a tipping point isn't 51 percent of the population right a tipping point may be somewhere between 18 and 25 percent yeah or maybe even four right yeah, but it depends. It's be the right people. It's got to be. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah. And so I've learned a long time ago. I am not equipped for politics, nor should I go anywhere near it. Um, but I know people who are there, and they know the right things to do. And um, again, at least in this country, we have options and opportunities that our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world do not yet have now where this really needs to shift quickly is how some of these same worldviews and narratives and vested interests in the high income countries end up in a modern day imperialistic action that restricts what people in low and middle income countries can do Right. I mean, this is this is really ugly and it's right. so all, all of this needs addressing. Um, but again, I think that there's 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 lots of work to be done in the vineyard. Right. And and helping individuals. We have no idea who's watching. Right. And and we know that more and more people are coming to this understanding that 
if I've been diagnosed with diabetes type 2, there's a lifestyle intervention that's well demonstrated to lead to whatever you want to call it reversal drug-free remission whatever and then you find the people saying yeah but you know if you go back to eating 60 percent of your calories from cereals industrial oils and and sugar you're gonna it's like well yeah maybe you don't do that. <laughs> it's like it's, the, it's, a, the, it's a tough road i mean it's an army of medical doctors who they have to protect their license you know they have to mm -hmm. do what they're what they were taught in school or else they get ostracized in various ways. So I just can't believe the thing, you know, I've been at this for 25 years, really studying nutrition since 93. Mm -hmm. So almost 30 years, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how come, uh, you know, the, the MDs are the smartest people in the country, but they're recommending the stupidest things ever, <laughs> you know, Oh, you got well, diabetes. Well, yeah. here's your first drug. And then a few more years later, second drug oh by the way eat the food that's causing your diabetes eat more of it mm, you know mm. it's just ridiculous and then they then they get everybody gets paid by insurance which is socialism by proxy so we don't we're not mm. getting politics but mm -hmm. no no i've been i've been communicating in various ways with the usda dietary guidelines advisory committee they have an email um i submitted a video mm -hmm. and i think you did too yeah yeah, yeah. you did and um and I, I studied these people like they their, their first meeting was, you know, almost a year ago. It's online. You can see it on YouTube. And um, I think that 16 of them have no idea what they're talking about at all regarding nutrition. Mm -hmm. And there's four of them that are vegan or vegetarian. And they mm -hmm. do know what they're talking about it's in their world, in their world of plants. Right. There's not one of them is going to promote uh, meat at all. And we're going to get the same stupid recommendations that we've been getting since 1980. So it's kind of disheartening. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you know, there's got to be this movement. There, there does have to be a grass, a grass based movement. Grassroots. Is that the yes. word I'm looking for? A ground? What's the word? Grass Grassroots. Grassroots. <laughs> yeah. Grass based yeah, yeah. movement, which is your Twitter handle and your mm -hmm. Instagram. So anyways, well, we just we'll just keep plugging along. Absolutely. Keep learning yeah. the thing, the tricky part, like I mentioned before, the tricky part is what's in PubMed. The preponderance of PubMed says LDL is bad. And that's not a true statement. LDL goes up because of infection. And so you have to tackle the infection. In my practice, I get people pooping out parasites on a weekly basis since 2007. You know, medicine has no clue about parasites, fungus, you know, candida, mold, moldy buildings. There's chronic infections that people get that they go to the hospital and they and the doctor says, oh, look, you have heart disease. No, it's it's candida or it's, you know, their diet's bad, but you got to look for that organism that's in their heart, too, or somehow affecting their heart. I mean, I get people pooping out four foot rope worms and 12 inch tapeworms and stuff. So mm. it's a whole new culture in, in healthcare when you have people you know, eliminating these horrible things out of their body. But in the meantime, most of medicine is just really clueless about improving health, cleaning the body, you know, getting, you know, kidneys and liver and lymphatic system work to work again. So it's like a, it's like a daunting task. So. Hmm. Well, courage. Thanks. Yeah. So, okay, let's, let's end off by doing this. I want you to, um, give your your introduction because we never did that at the beginning oh. and then i'm going to explain why i wanted to talk to you okay, okay. my i got that lecture coming up in february sure sure okay, and then i'll cut well, this and put this at the beginning okay okay all right, all go. right. well uh yeah so i i believe that the word existential is overused today, but I'm willing to say that humanity's existential crisis is insufficient animal source food in their diet. You know, when I said that 30% of calories from animal source food seems to be this critical point, the U.S. is not at 30%. It's 
just below. Yeah. That may be why we see somewhere between around a fifth of women of childbearing age in the US and UK being anemic. Yeah. You know, that's in that's, you know, high income countries and we have this. So, um, you know, there's there's um, a paper that suggested the lowest cost diets that provide sufficient nutrients are those that contain animal source foods. The lowest right? cost diet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. so economically and yeah, there's work we need to do to help make these more affordable and accessible, but um, that's there. There's the data that looks at the emissions intensity. Well, it's not even the emissions from a from food sources required to give a third of your requirements. And, you know, it starts at the top like this with wheat and it gets down to liver, you know, it's like. Or the emissions, the quantity of emissions. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, mono, mono agriculture is like, it's like, you know, I, I grew up, you know, driving the tractors in the fields, harvesting the sweet corn and going to tractor poles. You know, I imagine yeah. some of those tractors in the tractor poles, I call them smokies because of amount of black soot you know exhaust coming off that mm -hmm. it's not a tailpipe it's right in the front of the of the cab yeah, it's the stack yeah and it fills it fills the air so like swanton ohio is where i grew up south of swanton is bowling green ohio which where they have the national tractor pulling championship wow. right the best of the best the biggest tractors the smokiest tractors it's a 30 minute drive to go from bowling green to swanton so I, I'm at the Bowling Green, you know, I'm at this event and then I drive home and my yard smells like tractor exhaust, you know, and we're 30 minutes away. That's, mm -hmm. that's mono agriculture. That, that's mm -hmm. the, that's the exhaust anyways, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's things that can be improved and regenerative farming room in the agriculture needs to be enhanced. So that we're one not of my topics is is you know regenerating public health right you know and then Once through the west through the west indy price, price foundation i went to a seminar and it's about an hour and a half long about regenerative farming and um also this the farmer had a 200 acre soybean field there was no weeds in it whatsoever and it was all organic no spray mm -hmm. and um just healthy soil and everything he talked about for an hour and a half you could apply that to the human body it was amazing i took notes mm -hmm. about how it's like wait the things you said about the probiotics of the soil is true for human beings you know mm -hmm. and the healthy soil leads to healthy plants well true for the human body it's like an hour and a half lecture about the mm -hmm. human body but no it was actually about agriculture mm -hmm. so it's like they, they go hand in hand mm -hmm. so, yeah cool all right, so let's Alrighty, end up. Well, we've we've been at this a while. I hope you yes. got what you needed. I got what I needed. Yeah, I needed a bit more of um emotional boost after fighting with cardiologists on Twitter too <laughs> over the weekend. It's like, how can you promote? Don't be promoting sugar. Mm -hmm. You know, don't be promoting statins like that. I mean, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank All you, right, Darren. Okay. Good luck to you. Continue you know in your efforts and courage okay thank you you're on the right side i know <laughs> all it's right not always comfortable <laughs> but 